Doug said a lot of nice things, but I didn't really start with very appreciative nonetheless. Uh, I'll start by saying, man, it feels good to be in the blue team room. Woo! I, uh, I, I went and watched the first talk in the red team room to support a good friend colleague of mine. The talk was great. Uh, the room was, was horrible. The last round, everybody was wearing hoodies. Uh, so <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's was my thing, so I'm glad to be able to sign people here. Uh, <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, don't give me a great introduction, I won't spend too much on that. Um, but I, I spent most of my previous career in the Department of Defense, uh, building and leading various forms of uh, security operations centers, uh, basically catching bad guys. Uh, I do that now for fire. I spend most of my time trying to figure out ways to build a better mousetrap uh, and investigate what gets called a mousetrap, uh, which is not always the prettiest thing you gotta do. Um, aside from that, I am Robert Chief Pitmaster. I'm from the South, or in the South, and my gosh, if you're going to be in the South, I'd love a picture of ribs in your presentation. <laughs> yeah! So there we go. Um, I've already come up with books that you're going to have to analysis or have to monitor, and I'll something you want to out. So this presentation is uh, a little bit different that I'm not going to talk about uh, ones and zeros so much. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more uh, about uh, matters of the mind. Um, so I am currently in the process of, uh, I'm interested in that stuff, I'm pursuing a PhD in project psychology uh, to apply it to the investigative process and how we get that guys. Uh, but at the end of the day, I'm still not a psychologist, so uh, your knowledge may vary and that's worth this morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I try to put a sense uh, with every one of my presentations that said ultimately uh, what I, I hope people can get out of it. And the real thing uh, for this presentation is the concept of metacognition, uh, how it applies to the investigative process. Uh, and the benefits we can really derive from that. Uh, just to put your hands on, I'm also a flash here, I'm talking about cognitive bias. Did anybody see that talk here there are from mine? So sorry about you. Uh, of course, all my coworkers, so thanks. Even if you're lying. So we're going to talk about metacognition. And metacognition is a really fancy uh, psych psychology definition, but ultimately it's thinking about things. It's examining our thought processes and determining what's happening between left ear and right ear that helps us solve highly complex problems. Right? And that's not a challenge that's unique uh, to our field. It's something that every field involves some level of critical thinking has to deal with. Uh, we're actually just a little bit behind the curve there because our field is, is so new. Uh, and the interesting thing is that research out there shows that there's a value to uh, understanding and applying uh, metacognition, metacognition uh, in what you're doing. Right? And two components. So one is knowledge of cognition, so that's ultimately understanding how you think, how you approach complex problems. And the other part is regulation of cognition. So it's taking what you understand and applying it to what you do. Uh, other fields, again, are very good at this. Uh, medicine is one of them. Uh, my wife is a, is a medical doctor, and uh, been a part of her training, we talked about this, uh, really very little of her training, perspectively speaking, is uh, focused on you know, drugs and medicine and diseases and ailments. A lot of it's how to think, how to think clinically, how to approach things, how to do diagnosis from a cognitive sense. Uh, deductive analysis and things like that. So other fields do this too, and we need to start doing more of it. That's kind of my, my thesis statement on this, is we need to do more of it, and if we do, we'll be better at, again, catching bad guys. So we're going to talk about that cognition and concept and, and the kind of frame to the, the investigation. Uh, we boil down to what all of us do. Uh, you know, Doug gave a good example of yesterday when we talked about good versus evil. And really the construct we use as blue teamers to frame good and evil and, and find bad guys over the investigation. Whether you're a triage analyst or a malware analyst or a reverse engineer, all of you are doing some type of investigation, right? How many people in here do some type of investigation with Harvard at all? Most, very nearly everybody, right? Like, how many, just how many analysts do we have here as far as you deal with so you investigate them and you do with that? Several of you, great. So, we're gonna phrase, phrase things in terms of an investigation. So, what happened? Is there a bad guy? If so, what can you do? By the way, does anybody know, there's a lot of things that I guess all bad guys have in common, but there's one big thing that I think applies to any bad guy no matter what. What makes them a bad guy? Anybody have any thoughts? The hoodie. The hoodie? That's, that's it, no, that's not the answer. Motivation. Motivations. Yeah, I think so. So the big thing is, the way I phrase this is ultimately all bad guys must steal something from you. Right? And, we think about that in different ways, right? That stealing something can be something tangible, like intellectual property, uh, actual physical item. Uh, it can be something a little more nebulous, like um, your time, your resources, uh, your reputation for that matter, especially for big, big corporations that think reputation matters, and that examines that that hurts a lot of people. So, uh, attackers ultimately want to steal something from you. So that's a little bit of a side. So we're talking about perception and reality. 
Uh, I showed the same slide last year, and the big thing to, to understand is we have perception over here, we have reality over here, and there's a gap between those. So we have to acknowledge those are two separate things. Perception is how we see and interpret the world, and reality is how it exists. Now there's a whole existential discussion about whether reality is real and all that, and that's, that's an outside of uh, But ultimately, you have perception reality, and investigation in most cases is simply getting from perception to reality and hoping the reality is correct. Right? Now, I'm going to line perception to reality here as a straight line, uh, but in most cases, it's actually a little bit more like this. Uh, you have multiple paths you can take, various options within those paths, and when you get to reality, a lot of times you really have no way to validate whether you're there. But when you are there, you hope you're taking the, uh, the right path. Now, the trick is how we navigate uh, this kind of web of perception of reality is based on two main things. One is our mindset, where we see the world, the other are our biases. So if you saw my talk last year, I talked pretty much exclusively about biases. That's out there online if you want to look at that. Uh, do so, I'm not going to delve into that too much here. Uh, biases are part of that, but the other that is really focused on mindsets. Now, mindset uh, as a person is shaped by really everything. It's shaped by where you're from, uh, your parents, your family, your friends, your experiences, both good and bad. Uh, mindsets are not a good thing, they're not a bad thing, they're just a thing. They can affect us both, affect us both positively and negatively. Uh, so that's what, when we see the world, that's what we see the world through our mindsets. Uh, the interesting thing that the research shows us is mindsets are very quick to, to form and very resistant to change. Right? Humans are inherently judgmental. Now, we don't hear that, we are. We judge people, we judge situations, it's just what it is. Um, not a good thing, but that's where we are. See, the thing to understand this is the concept of what I, uh, what I just call this, we'll call initial blur. So when we're presented with a really complex cognitive challenge, we have some level of blur, right? And that's when we talk about our perception. It's blur. We don't know if it's reality. We have to uh, do some critical thinking and pull in that sort of system. We have to get to that reality. Now, the thing with initial blur is, and what research in other areas shows us, is that the higher the initial degree of blur, the harder it is for us to get to a more accurate perception of reality, right? So if things are still a little nebulous, you kind of know what's going on, but not really, versus you really have no idea, and just all the data is not there. There's a big difference. It's not just the context about the data, it's the ability for our mind to put it together. And that's, that's kind of a big deal, especially in terms of like alert investigation, right? Uh, if you have an alert and it comes to you, and you have all the data you need to investigate right there, you're diminishing that initial alert. And that's very helpful. Versus if you have to go out and go to multiple data sources and get all that data, you have to go to the host, and you have to go to the work sensor, and you have to go to you know, whatever else and pull that back, and you don't necessarily have that complete picture at first. It's not really ready to finish. You know, that's something we can't really hopefully do a lot about, uh, but there are some things we can do. Um, a couple of examples. Uh, one, obviously, is providing uh, relevant information up front when you can. That's pretty helpful. Uh, the other kind of thing is uh, moving towards the concept of what I call realistic time alert. Everybody talks about real time alert. Uh, I'm sure somebody knows the stat. I'm sure that part of the room definitely knows the stat. What is the, uh, the average time from breach to detection? Days. Yeah, it's a little over 200 days, right? So if the average time from breach to detection is 200 days, is it reasonable to, to all of a sudden say, we want to catch every breach at real time, like the second it happens? And that's something bar maybe a little high? I think so. And ultimately, the fact of the matter is, when an attacker gets in when he first breaches the network, he's not done. And it really hasn't accomplished his mission. The goal isn't to stop the attacker from getting in at this point, in my opinion. It is to stop the attacker from accomplishing the mission. Still into that. That's hard. Um, I made fun of the red team guys, but their job is just as hard as ours. Um, and I don't really like to hear that, but it's very difficult once you get in. Uh, that's a lot of times when the challenge starts. That's when you have to move around, get past other controls, find the data that you need to find. I just don't find that on my own network, but on someone else's. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a problem that sometimes we don't want to do. Uh, so, realistic kind of learning is using processes, designing the processes we use. To analyze data in a matter that is delivered to us more completely, as opposed to just giving us an idea of what enough is. Right? If I'm perfectly fine with an alert coming in four hours after the initial detection, even maybe four days after the initial detection, if it gives me a whole lot more information, it's a lot more enriched, it's a lot more actionable, it has a lot more information that I can use to go forth and investigate further. That's what I talk about when I talk about realistic kind of learning. That's something I'm not really doing a lot as an industry right now, but everybody uh, wants real time. Uh, I just don't think real time is realistic. 
Uh, the other thing is more the triage, triage function. Uh, so when I say that, uh, I talk about the process of getting an alert, make, putting together what Google information you need to, uh, to make a very preliminary decision on whether it's a, a quick false positive or needs more investigation. So uh, I believe you get more out of your analyst in terms of, of cognitive workflow when you break that off into some functions. So what I'm talking about here in big organizations is two levels of analysis. So your alerts come in, your triage analysis gets, up, gets the first alert, gathers information, makes a recommendation, passes it on to someone else. And there's a lot of reasons beyond initial alert why that makes sense. Uh, one is because of bias, as we talked about before, analysts form biases, and that may shape the investigation, so we hand that off to another analyst. They can then usually apply their different biases, and then you eliminate some of the biases at that point, so that's very helpful. Uh, obviously, that's not very realistic in small organizations. Uh, partner analysis is a good way to do that there. Have an analyst who gets the, the alert, does the initial information gathering, puts it together, makes a recommendation, passes it to the next analyst, uh, and then that's when the second part. You can throw it back and forth between days. But I think formalization of triage function is incredibly, incredibly important for that area. Uh, another thing I want to talk about is uh, intentional lines. So attention is really neat because it basically allows us to focus on things. Many of you are focused on me, so you're focused on your phone, and it's on two. Many of you are focused on me, and, uh, and it's our attention span that lets us do that. Now, I think we all know that attention is somewhat of a finite resource. Many of you are listening to me now, may not listen to me in 10 minutes. I get it, that's fine. We just have to ask them so much. Uh, but attention is an interesting thing. So there's overt attention and covert attention. Overt attention is when you are uh, actually looking at something and giving it visual attention. So it's looking at somebody at the person on the front row, because I'm overt attention. Sorry for calling you out. Uh, covert attention is when somebody has your attention that's off the side. Uh, you're not necessarily uh, looking at it. So if there was a sound going on behind me, I wasn't actually looking at it, that would be covert attention. It would be fighting for my attention resources. Again, it's a limited resource to want so much of it. Uh, when we talk about analysts, we have to be very careful about where we apply our attention. Uh, because there's a lot of things right in front of us. Uh, our tools don't always do the best job. Uh, so for instance, I'm glad the screen is big because the text is small, but this is a TCP I've got with. Uh, and there may be a couple things people find anomalous. Does anybody find anything? And if you read my blog, you've seen this in some spoil. Does anybody see anything maybe a little more anomalous than something else? Data on a SIM packet. Uh, packet group? Yeah. Uh, data on a SIM packet. That's perfectly fine, uh, but it's a little annoying per se. It's RC, perfectly fine. Uh, but as far as from an analysis perspective, that's something maybe we're not used to seeing. Um, and the thing is, most of us don't see it. I know if I saw the tag capture, I probably would notice it the first thing I made it, actually, so it's not know about it. Uh, but otherwise, if you're not kind of attuned to looking for those things, if your attention isn't, uh, you don't have any experience level to know where to look at certain things like that, or something just out, falls outside of a normal attentional boundary, uh, where you might focus your gaze, then you're not going to notice it. And that's really the, probably the biggest hobby of challenge for me. Analysis is attention to detail in the right areas. So not just attention to detail, get that experience back and put it in the right areas. And that's very hard to do. We'll talk about training challenges here in a minute. But ultimately, what I'm saying is it's very interesting right in front of us uh, because of intentional blindness, uh, which defined is ultimately saying looking directly at something but missing something that you are giving your whole attention to. Uh, so the interesting thing, I guess, is this is TCP. I mean, it's an example of a tool. It's a very useful tool. I love that it's almost every day. Uh, but it doesn't really do a lot for us in terms of directing our attention. Right? And that's why people like tools like Artshark. Right? First of all, it's graphical, and that's a little easier. But it also has a lot of different uh, visual cues here. Uh, we see that these packets are linked by this little visual cue with the color coding going on, uh, various section headings, visions of different types of data, uh, all very useful visual cues to help serve to direct our attention. Now, I show this as a, as a uh, kind of message to folks that are responsible for configuring and setting up an analysis environment uh, because it's very useful to, uh, uh, to build in these visual cues so that you can, especially if the analysts are inexperienced, direct their gaze in a certain location uh, and help focus that attention. Uh, so, dimension and potential bias and experienced analysts are usually less susceptible. Um, the other thing that's very important is mastering your environment. Uh, if anybody uh, cooks a lot, if you ever throw meat in floss, uh, everything in place. If you ever watch a professional chef work, uh, when they grab things, they often aren't even looking at you because they master their environment. They know that their cutting boards here, and their ingredients are here, and their path is here. They know where it's all at. Just like that, as analysts, we need to know basically where our data lives, what tools we use to access it, and what the limitations of those are. At any given time, you should pretty, have a pretty good understanding of I have a question related to an investigation. How do I go out and get the answer? 
The less time you spend figuring out how to get the answer, the more time you tend to get in and analyze the data, the better job you're probably doing. Uh, another unique thing in one of the areas I'm focusing on right now uh, is gaze, uh, gaze studies where you're, uh, you have a device that sits in front of the computer, it fixates on the pupil, and tracks where you look on the screen and compares to certain data. So we, we throw data out, we can, uh, it, it's, we use this in other areas of psychology, but it's basically a way to look um, at different data points because ultimately our eyes uh, move faster than our brain interprets what we're seeing. So oftentimes we're looking at things, uh, analyzing things in an order and a fashion or focusing on things in a way that we actually don't know what to do. Uh, so gaze track, you know, going to things like these heat maps here and directional arrows to show which way our gaze moves. Just bring any things in terms of uh, data analysis. So my hope is uh, maybe this time next year I'll have some cool, some cool things to show you in that regard. So intuition and memory. Uh, Socks are interesting in the University of Paris, excuse me, Kansas State University did a study uh, a couple years ago now uh, talking about uh, the ethnography of socks, the kind of culture of the, the security operations center. And the biggest finding they had that stuck out to me was kind of the topic that investigative knowledge is tacit. Tacit, what does that mean? Well, it means you can't really often write it down and tell people how to do it. So if you go up to someone who's an expert analyst and say, hey, why are you so good at finding evil? They also can't tell you. Right? They might cite some tools or something like that. You can tell you the thought process they go through. And that's a bit of a problem. Um, other fields face it, but in medicine, if you ask the doctor why they're good, they'll often say, well, it's because I use this process or this process or this process. And they use a little more medic cognitively aware than we are uh, in our field sometimes. Um, the problem being that with senior animals can't explain why they're good, what they do, junior animals can't really learn. Um, and that is a problem. So, um, all that's to say, summed up as analysts rely on intuition. You know, intuition is a little bit of an interesting thing, uh, because up until somewhat recently, it wasn't really accepted as real. Uh, most psychologists, uh, even the, the Sigmund Freud, who uh, most people, it's kind of a household name in terms of psychology, uh, had this quote here that intuition is basically an illusion, uh, and you should really accept the it. So that's interesting, but modern technology is focused a little bit more. Uh, they have a, a great device now called an fMRI machine. Had an FMRI, FMRI scan for some reason. It basically allows you to uh, perform experiments and measure the output of certain parts of the brain. Uh, you see FMRI scan results at the bottom left here. Yeah. Um, and what they found through a series of experiments, I won't go into the details, but you can, uh, you can see this interesting TED Talk, and I can provide the research if anybody wants to see it. But basically, by examining professional versus amateur chess players and seeing how they interpret movement and how they make their decisions. They identify an area in the brain called the cuneus. And it says, you see it's not there, it's talking about here, right about on the top of my ball spot. Um, that's the cuneus. And I think that intuition is basically uh, spawned from there. So that what they're saying is they think there's a biological basis for intuition. It's actually a real thing. This really changed how the psychology world looked at intuition uh, you know, as a construct. Once a whole lot of more interesting experimentation, which is interesting. Um, so, I don't have a lot of time, but I want to step aside and talk about memory for just a second. Uh, memory, very simply, there's a lot of models for it, a lot of ways to explain it. Um, the most common is this right here. Sensory, short-term, long-term. You think of sensory is, if you're looking at me, you close your eyes, and if you see the screen on your eyes for just a second, uh, that short sight span is kind of sensory memory. Short-term memory is called working memory a lot of the times. It is ultimately the memory model we use when we're actually solving problems, which is our near term memory. But you have to repeat something frequently uh, to keep it you know, kind of fresh on your mind, you're using short term memory. Long term memory is obviously where our long term memory is stored. Uh, think of short term memory like RAM, long term memory like this. Reason. So there's a lot of memories with working, or a lot of models with working memory too. And one of the most common is Badley's model, uh, which consists of these four components right here. And the one that's really interesting is that these are spatial sketch had. And it's what we use to visually manipulate uh, objects. So you see I have a picture of a cube on the screen right now, and the green square is on top. Now if you put that in your mind, you can imagine the green square rotating so it's facing you, you're using your visual memory, uh, your, your visual spatial sketch pad as part of working memory to manipulate that. Right? And the interesting thing about the VS, uh, uh, visual spatial sketch pad is that it also will be mapped to the Burkini's. Right? So the general Hypothesis right now is that people believe that intuition is strongly related to our ability to visually picture solving problems. And that changes a lot of things. Right? Like, you know that if you have a lot of complex data, like visual cells parse it, but even for like very simple problems, uh, the ability to picture things uh, could be one of the keys to greatly increasing the human cognition 
obsession with reality gap, are uh, decreasing the gap and increasing our ability to solve problems. Right, so that's very interesting. And if you think about a lot of other fields, uh, they kind of apply this too. Right? When you talk about you talk to expert chess players, they'll say they can see the board, they can see five or six steps ahead. You talk to stockbrokers, they can see the patterns that go on. Even musicians can say, uh, the first choice of expert musicians are often quoted saying they can see the music beyond the hearing. Right? And that could very easily apply to the world of uh, security investigation as well. So how do we apply that? Well, there's a, a lot more research to be done there. Um, very simply, the first thing to draw a picture because your brain's probably trying to do that anyway. Um, subconsciously, right? There's a lot of things going on in our heads that you can't really, uh, we don't really know we're happy. But the theory is that that magic is happening anyway, so we draw a picture to cover yourself out. The other thing is to visualize that appropriately. And I'll be the first one to say, I hate stupid visualizations. Like, you always have to have a guy who's like, I'm going to take every story from the network and draw a big uh, graph for it, and like, here's a bunch of clustered dots. Uh, everybody doesn't want to stop in there to roll the right? So, um, but that, uh, that's an interesting way. I hate bad visualizations. Uh, some of them are very useful, right? Incident timelines. I think we all love incident timelines. We can visualize things occurring over time. That's usually a win. Uh, another thing to link graphs, uh, the ability to visualize relationships, and that's pretty clutch. Um, so we can visualize relationships of a lot of different things, right? We can visualize the relationships of breakfast items. Uh, we're in the south, so they're course server groups. Um, but you can be very sitting in the middle of that, trust me. Um, so you can think of breakfast in terms of visual relationships, nouns and verbs. You can do the same thing with breaches, right? So we can very see clearly kind of where the center of the breach is here, uh, and we can see how things relate to it. Uh, when we can see how things relate to each other, we can map those to schemas in our minds, because memory is mostly thought to be organized in terms of schemas. And if we can do that, we can remember things uh, quite a bit better and uh, use work and memory more efficiently. Interesting thing about working memory too, it's also a limited resource. Just like attention, only so many things can be held into, uh, into working memory. Uh, so you may have term magic number seven, and that's to say that generally most humans can remember seven uh, kind of low fidelity items in their mind at one at any given point in time, plus or minus two. So the rank is kind of five to nine. Um, and the complexity of the items matters. Uh, so obviously I have a couple of uh, relevant examples here. Um, so if I, as an analyst, am trying to solve a very complex problem, I piece together a lot of uh, different pieces of the puzzle, and I have to remember uh, this, then that's going to take up part of my working memory uh, and really decrease my effectiveness uh, versus remembering something like this. Now granted, we all know there are follies to just trying to associate with the with this the file bank with the chains and so on, um, but it's important to understand these past limitations. So a couple of quick uh, ways to diminish this. This is another area where more research is, uh, is going to be required. One is source monitoring. One of the number one reasons people make uh, memory errors is because they forget where they learned something. Uh, if that may be a person, you can think of a conference talk you had a couple of years ago, uh, and you can't remember who gave it, and that's a source monitoring error. Same with information. I don't remember if I, gave, if I got this information from the sim, or if I got some packets, or post ad or memory. Um, uh, the other thing is chunky. Uh, and chunky is an area, especially in, in this area where there's not a lot of research, but basically the ability to group things together similarly. And this is a technique that people use to remember, you know, tie to 100 digits. Chunking line numbers together and dissecting them somehow. Um, the ability to chunk information in our tools and how we do analysis um, in that way. Um, the last thing, very quickly, is magic against the steam, as I mentioned this, we talked about breakfast. If I ask you to remember these five items a day from now, you're probably going to forget them. If I ask you to remember these five, you might be more likely to use your related to a schema in your mind as you break this. So, mapping these to schemas is a very good step to, uh, to that relational type analysis. So, that's pretty much it. The big thing, you know, I said you have to be kind of knowledgeable about your cognition and as part of that cognition, and you have to apply it. This talk is obviously a little bit more about getting knowledge of it because some of the good research to apply it really hasn't been done yet. Um, so my hope is people can take this, they'll get interested in, and maybe uh, uh, we can get some more collective uh, industry uh, understanding of how we think, you think about thinking, do more research, and do more cool things. Uh, I'm certainly going to try to do some of that myself. Any questions? Yeah, I have one. So we kind of talked about like this um, memory working set, and we kind of see that with like jargon and words. Do you think that that's something that would be good for an incident response team to kind of? Come up with the here's the shortened versions of all these things that they all agree on, so it's easier to. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's all about the, the question is how kind of the common nomenclature really amongst your team. And that's certainly good. I mean, 
When you consider that the working memory is a finite resource, the more time you have to spend translating a word you don't know to a concept you do know is time you spend doing other things that are more important. Besides adjusting how you look at your workshop console, how are you applying this in your day job? What other ways would you have to do it? So I think uh, so how are you applying how do you apply this type of thing in your day job? Uh, and I think there, there are kind of two sides. One is for the tool developer side, and we kind of all understand that there's a lot of work that goes into that. From an individual analyst, what can I do to take this knowledge and make it more applicable to me as an analyst? I think the big thing is guarding, is it's kind of putting a shield up in front of your working memory. Like we all want more data and more data, but at the end of the day, we do the best analysis when we get just the minimal amount of data that's needed, right? So it's not going out to a sensor and getting a gig of PCAP and then getting away, getting rid of the things you don't need to go in the way. It's going out, it's figuring out what we think we need, maybe starting to flow that, uh, figuring out what, you know, what flows we're interested in, and then going to the PCAP and then just getting what we need. So it's guarding your working memory, keeping uh, a very finite focus on what you need and trying to make sure it's available very, very quickly and not really positive. So how do you think about the workflow when you're actually trying to bring up assets and you have that new analyst and you mentioned that Teaching them is very difficult, and I can see that completely. Are there any particular approaches you found that work better to get that kind of knowledge transfer working with them? So, are there any approaches for, for teaching new analysts using kind of some of these methods uh, of how to be analysts that are beyond the typical watch and learn model? I think there are. I'm not really, I'm still early enough in my research. I'm not going to say I have all the answers on this because I don't yet. I'm hoping that we get there. Um, but I don't, I, mean, I don't have anything concrete yet. I've got some general ideas, but I don't want to put them out there until they're based on my test. Hey, uh, I find it interesting you said uh, keep seven digits and add uh, seven. But uh, I've heard that you can see 30 distinct things in your view at a time. And then uh, to go with that, I always heard that Einstein and uh, Hawking like built the word problems into the geometric problems and then work those out. Absolutely, and I think what you're talking about right there is, is the schema thing, right? Like those guys, they have schemas for these, these computations, and they can take all these things that they couldn't remember otherwise, fits in, into the schema that is a mathematical computation, and they understand that very well, then that's their cognitive shortcut to remembering all of those things for sure. Okay, great talk, Chris. Uh, we've got a couple giveaways.